Good morning, everybody. How many of you have seen the movie Maid of Honor? Uh, it's a romantic comedy, supposedly. Yeah, I'm not talking about Maid of Honor, the, the war show, the war movie, okay? Um, it stars Patrick Dempsey. Yeah, you've seen it, okay. So for those of you who've seen it, I watched it and I laughed a lot, but after the movie, I felt really bad. And then the more I reflected on the film, I realized how much I hated the film. And here's why, let me tell you this story, so spoiler alert. Uh, the movie stars Patrick Dempsey, and it's about this guy who has a best friend who's a girl. And they've been best friends for many, many years. And then the girl suddenly gets engaged to this really wonderful, nice guy. Uh, I think it was a, Scot a Scottish guy or an Irish guy who, who got the girl's heart. And so the more Patrick Dempsey, uh, and apparently the girl wanted Patrick to be her best man, or maid of honor slash best man, because they've been best friends for so long. And the more they went through the, the wedding, wedding preparations and engagement, Dempsey realizes too late that he's in love with, her, with his best friend. And so throughout the whole film, it's supposed to be funny, but basically, he stole the bride from an innocent, nice guy. That's the story. The groom was a good guy. He, he was without fault, with no guilt whatsoever. And uh, it was supposed to be a comedy romance. It was supposed to be cute and charming. But the whole thing that it promoted was, as long as you feel it, you can get the girl. Even if she's already engaged to a guy who did nothing wrong to anyone. So that's maid of honor, which I thought was not honorable. <laughs> okay, so the more I thought about that film and then I thought about the text today, I said, wow, what a wonderful illustration. So today, we're going to discuss something that's quite long, so please bear with me. And not only is it gonna be long, it's also going to be quite heavy. So brace yourselves, okay? So last week, we were what? We were talking about what? It was Jesus talking to Nicodemus. And they talked after Jesus made a huge commotion at the temple. He turned tables. He made an entire issue of the whole moneymakers uh, in the temple. And so after that, Jesus' popularity grew. Of course, people would start talking. Hey, did you hear about this guy? Uh, I hear he's a son of a carpenter, and he's a carpenter himself. And he's actually a prophet also. So his popularity grew. His signs and miracles authenticated his ministry. People followed him. So the crowds were running towards Jesus. Whatever happened to John the Baptist? Whatever happened to the quote-unquote voice in the desert who was supposed to prepare the way for Christ? So he's going to re-enter the scene here. So in John chapter 3, we'll start with verse 22. They actually meet. Okay. So verse 22. After this, so when they say this, it's all of those things that happened previously. After all those things, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside and he remained there with them and was baptizing. So the Judean countryside basically means Jesus left Jerusalem. He left the capital, okay? So he's going to be in a more provincial setting now. And this sentence really sets up today's theme. This sentence, the whole, the disciples uh, went with him sets the whole theme today. It's all about loyalty. Loyalty to Christ. Loyalty to Jesus and His Word. And the more I thought about it, and I read some commentaries, Jerusalem was really the place to be. If, if you liken it to today, it's going to be a city where the Judean countryside would be like a province for us. And most people would love to live in the city. Not only that, if you were a Jew, you would have to travel to Jerusalem at least once a year for all the festivals and all the things you'd have to do. So it's such a hassle to live far away. It would be so much more comfortable if you lived in a place where all your life can revolve in that one area. And remember, there were no airplanes yet, there's no piece of air, which means travel was so tiring. But the disciples went with Christ. So this was, in a way, showing that the disciples left comfort zones. They left whatever was comfortable, and it wasn't, for them it wasn't a big deal as long as they were with Jesus. Now the funny thing here, and I know I'm 
uh, pausing here in this verse alone because today we have so many reasons to examine our hearts. Why do we do ministry? Is it because it's where God called us? Or is it because it's comfortable? I recently um, saw on Facebook all these, uh, well, not so recently, but a few months back, I saw on Facebook these people and they were so excited to go on a mission trip. And I wish I could rejoice, but it was a three-day mission trip to one of the most beautiful places in Japan. And I'm thinking, I don't know if that's really calling and mission or that's, you know, a vacation. Seriously, three days? Missionaries before would spend months, sometimes even years or even their whole lives. They packed their belongings in coffins because they knew that once they get to that mission field, they'll die there and probably get buried there. And yet today, it's like, oh, I feel like I'm called to do missions. Where? Hawaii. Can you imagine that? I don't think it, that's something that pleases God. Unless, of course, it's legitimate, you know, but I mean, oh my goodness, comfort zones are calling. Now look at verse 23. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized for John had not yet been put in prison. So why did they go to this particular mission field? It was because ministry at the time needed water. And again, today we have, uh, what? We have so many different suppliers for water. Before, all they had were rivers and streams. So they had to go where ministry would be practical. So even if it's far, even if it's tiring, it's inconvenient, that's where we can do ministry the most, so that's where we're going. So they went. It was practical, it was logical. Again, it's the opposite of what usually happens today, which is, where do you feel God's calling you? Well, God's calling me there. By faith, I'll make it. Have you prepared? No, it's by faith. Have you studied the environment, the culture? Have you prepared for the religions that they, those people believe over there? No, but by faith, it will happen. Well, have you prepared? Have you read your Bible and understood how you can interpret the Bible for the people who are living there in their context? No, but by faith. That's not really wise. We have to be more practical. Yes, we believe in faith. Yes, we believe God will provide. Yes, we believe God will do all those things for us, but it doesn't mean that we don't do our homework. We also need to prepare. And I'm sure we have several missionaries here. You've prepared. You've gone through a lot of trainings. You've gone through preparation. You've gone through some, some equipping in your own home churches because we want to make sure that we're good stewards for God and His glory. And so they went where it was practical. The thing is, the ministry of John now overlapped with the ministry of Jesus. They, they actually meet in the same area. Now picture this with me for a moment. Imagine, so you guys saw outside, so we're in IPI, and then right outside there's the gallery, right? Can you imagine if a new church opened right there in the gallery? Very close to us. Picture it. I'm sure there will be some concerns. It's going to be uh, a little awkward, so we have the pastors have to talk, so we're, we're here and you're there, and what do you teach? Uh, what do we teach? There has to be conversation, right? But how would the flesh respond? We'd probably think this way. Oh my gosh, market share is going to be risky. How many unbelievers are in the area, and I wonder if you know, there's going to be a competition between our church and their church and you know the popularity of this church versus the popularity of that church and i hate to say it but it happens today until today those issues arise so we think well maybe they were more sanctified before let's take a look verse 25 now a discussion arose between some of john's disciples and a jew over purification and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, 
He is baptizing and all are going to Him. Okay. What was the issue? Purification. The issue was about how can you become acceptable to God? During their day, it was all about purification. The more pure you are through the ritual cleansings and the purification rites, then God would accept you. God would love you and bless you and give you favor. And do you remember the fulfillment theme we keep talking about? That Jesus fulfills everything in the Old Testament, even the rituals, even the purifications. And John was the last Old Testament prophet. He was baptizing. Jesus was baptizing. So the real issue was not really about ritual purification. Here's the real issue. Was the baptism of John the best baptism there was? Or is Jesus' baptism better? So the disciples of John were going to John and they were concerned. You're baptizing us. That guy Jesus is baptizing us. And um, he, he's making miracles, John. What have you done? The Bible doesn't give us any record of John the Baptist performing any miracles. Think of all the prophets and compare John. Moses split the Red Sea. Elijah called fire from heaven. Jeremiah prophesied to several kings. Elisha reanimated a corpse. What did John do? No miracles. No signs. All he did was just say, I'm a voice in the desert and I'm sent to prepare the way. He, he made himself small, in fact. He could have said, well, I'm prophesied by Malachi and all the other Old Testaments. You're supposed to know me. He didn't do that. You see, the old prophets of the Old Testament, they showcased the power of God. John the Baptist showcased the Son of God. And yet, he humbled himself. Now, what happened? The disciples of John got jealous. How do we know? First, the name of Jesus was never mentioned. When you talk about a rabbi or a prophet, you're supposed to mention the name as a sign of respect, at least in their culture. But what did they say? Rabbi. So they referred to John as rabbi. Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness. Look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. Their concern was sheep stealing. Oh my gosh, he's becoming more popular. There's division. You remember in Corinth, the issue was about division also and loyalty. And they were saying, I'm with Apollos. Oh, I'm with Paul. Oh, I'm with Peter. And some said, well, I'm with Jesus. And then what did Paul say? He said, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? Servants through whom you believed. We're nobodies. We're just servants. And today, it still happens. There's still division. There's sometimes unbiblical loyalty to pastors, and that reveals our deceitful hearts. Sometimes people are immature, of course. People are young. For all you know, a, Christ a person just got born again last week because of a preaching of a pastor, and so of course there's an emotional attachment there's the whole, well, I got born again in this church, therefore I have a sentimental attachment, which is okay. But if after so many, many, many years, there's an unbiblical or ungodly loyalty to people, that's dangerous. It becomes idolatrous. And it, it becomes an emotionally codependent relationship. So just like today, so it before, the disciples of John felt offended for their own leader, their own teacher or pastor. That's cultic behavior. Imagine for a moment that there's a church, and the name of the church is awesome, okay? Picture this name. This is a fictitious name, all right? But imagine if the church's name is Jesus Christ, who owns all the glory as sovereign king over the universe, Christian Fellowship Church. Wow. What a Christ-exalting, glorifying name, right? But then what if the practices of the church did this? Listen to the sermons of Pastor X, the testimony of Pastor X. Listen to the, ser the, the quotations of Pastor X. We promote Pastor X. Here are the books of Pastor X. 
and Pastor X will be preaching today. Here, Pastor X now. Who was really glorified? Pastor X, not Jesus. It can be very dangerous. Let me give you an example of that. There's a book, I'm doing show and tell again today. The title of the book is A Tale of Three Kings, written by Gene Edwards, okay? Now, I normally read a lot of books and I review them as well. Here's my comment in red ink. I said, this book is one of the best tools to manipulate church members. No verses, all Jesus, terrible applications, and not a single verse reference or even a footnote. What's the, what's the thesis of this book? There are three. First, the book says, Gene Edwards says, no one can know which leaders are from God and which ones are not. You can never really know if they're from God or, f or not. That's the first thesis. And it's explicitly stated in pages 13, 21, 22, 25, 43, 44, 49, and 59. I kid you not, it's, it's a real actual book review. Therefore, his second thesis says, we should never question our leaders. Touch not the Lord's anointed. We should never even fight back or expose falsehood. If we leave the church, if you leave the church for false teaching, Shut up, do it quietly, leave alone, and deal with it yourself because you are a sinner and a broken vessel, okay? And here's the third thesis. Division in any church is always wrong without any exceptions whatsoever, okay? So the second thesis explicitly stated in pages 15, 18, 20, 24, 27, 28, 31, 34, 36, and 37, all right? Third thesis in pages 60, 64, and 66. Why do I say this? Because many churches recommend this book to their members. You know what they're actually trying to do? Think about it. This book says you can never really tell. So imagine if I'm the leader of a church, if I'm the pastor of a church, and I give this book to the member, what am I doing? I'm saying, if you want to be a leader in my church, read this book so that you will become convinced to never question me. You can never question my authority. You can never question my teachings. You can never, if I preach anything false, you cannot expose it. And if you disagree, shut up and leave because you're a broken sinner. That's one of the most manipulative things church leaders can do. That's dangerous. And why do I say that? Because today, just like before, there's a tendency for people to become loyal to their leaders to a fault. Okay, they're unbiblical, unbiblically loyal, or, or the loyalty has become idolatrous. Look at verse 27. Look at how John the Baptist responds. He didn't say, yeah, well, you know, Jesus, he's great and all that, but I was the one who preached this gospel to you, so stick with me. John never did that. Look at what John said. Verse 27. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. Not even one thing. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Paul says, what did you not, uh, what did you receive? Oh, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, why boast as if you did not receive it? So Paul is saying, every single thing that we have here on earth, we receive from God. Any good, gracious thing is from God. When you're a Christian, you have to understand something. Once you're a Christian, you have to understand that there's no such thing as personal property. Everything belongs to God. The hair on your head, the clothes on your back, every centavo in your bank account belongs to God. Even ministry is by grace. Your calling is by grace. If you're here because you're a missionary, you're here because you want to lead a Bible study, or you're here because you're doing discipleship, that's a ministry, and it's by grace. Your calling is by grace. These are privileges. These are ill-deserved and impossible to earn. And if ministry is by grace, then there is no place for competition in any ministry. We're not supposed to feel competitive. We know that God is the one who causes numerical growth. Don't we agree? In the book of Acts, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit added to their number. It was the Holy Spirit who added to the number. Now, who causes the spiritual growth? 
still God. Remember what Paul said? Someone plants the seed, another waters, another cultivates. So in our day, it could be likened to someone shared the gospel, another person was doing the discipleship, another one was really praying hard, but only God causes the growth. So if numerical growth comes from God and spiritual growth comes from God, then why compete? There's no reason to compete. In fact, John the Baptist goes one step further. He even adds in verse 28, you, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He's saying, I told you long ago that your loyalty is supposed to be to Jesus. So if people are going to Jesus, that's great. That's, that was my goal in the first place. We're only maps and signposts. We're not supposed to have what we call the messianic complex. You know what that means? The messianic complex is the belief that you are someone else's savior. Like if someone is going through a rough patch, especially if you know the Bible, you're very theological and you, you're spiritually mature, there's this temptation to think, he's got a problem, he should come talk to me because I know the Bible and I know theology and I'm very accurate and I can help the person. If he goes to other pastors and counselors, big mistake. He should come to me and just me. That's the Messiah complex. You're not the Savior. You're not the one who's going to change growth. Nobody is except Christ. So to John, there's no competition. And then John uses an analogy. He says, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He likens himself to the best man. Not the Patrick Dempsey best man who stole the bride, but a good best man. Okay, what, what's the role of a best man? Today, it's to, I don't know for you guys, but from what I understand, today, the role of the best man is basically three to keep the wedding rings, to make sure that the groom isn't stressed at all on the wedding day, and to give an awesome toast, right? That's basically today. But before, the Jewish best man had two extra roles, all right? What are those two? First, the best man makes sure that the, br that the groom receives his bride on the wedding day in good condition. So the, the best man not only watches over the groom, but also watches over the bride even before the wedding. Okay? Secondly, the Jewish best man has to make sure that the seven-day festivities, the reception, which lasted for seven days, had to go smoothly. So if someone asks you to be a, the best man for a Jewish wedding, brace yourself. File the leaves from the office. Because that's, that's really, really hard. And in the Old Testament, interestingly, God calls Israel his bride. God always refers to Israel as his beloved, his bride. And he calls himself the groom. And so John the Baptist says, I'm just the best man. Here is now Jesus, the son of God, and I'm just preparing the bride so that the groom gets the bride and I'm happy. I rejoice. That was my job in the first place. And so when he gives the speech, he doesn't try to steal the show. He points to the relationship. How many of you have attended weddings? Yes? Now, of all the weddings have you, that you've attended, think for a moment of the best, best man speeches you've ever read, heard. They're in your head? Now think of the worst best man speeches you've ever heard. Okay. Now, I don't know about you. I've attended several weddings. The worst best man speech I've ever heard, no names, of course, but went something like this. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm not prepared. I wish I prepared. Um, let me just tell you how I feel today about this wedding. First, congratulations, cheers, dude. I'm so happy for you. Uh, when we were kids, I've known the groom since we were kids. Um, 
we were uh, good friends, and um, he's a great guy. You're, 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 you got a great catch. Uh, congratulations, and that's great. Uh, please all rise to join me in a toast. <laughs> so that guy kind of stole the show in a negative way. There are also types that steal the show in a sort of positive way. They deliver the best emotional, most heartwarming speeches, yet at the end of the day, people remember the speech of the best man more than the relationship of the bride and the groom. Have you heard those? To me, those are terrible too. Because the goal of the best man is to point to the couple and once the couple and the relationship and what God has done in their lives, when that is lifted up and elevated and they see God is so amazing in your lives, wow, God is faithful, the best man is supposed to just disappear from everyone's thoughts. They're, just, they're supposed to remember how wonderful God was in the relationship more than how eloquent the best man was in the speech. Now, Imagine if this was what happened in churches. How scary and how terrible would it be if a non-Christian came to this church and said, I came to New Covenant Church looking for Jesus, but Pastor David Chan got in the way. Can you picture that? A non-believer saying, I came, I wanted to know Jesus, but the preachers kind of got in the way of that. They tried to kind of steal the show. They were glory thieves. John was different. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. Let me say that again. He must increase. I must decrease. That has to be the rallying cry of every leader, every church uh, minister, every pastor, and every preacher is to say we have to decrease. Verse 31, He who comes up from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. So John the Baptist is saying, you know, I'm happy. I'm glad people are going to Jesus. Jesus has heavenly origin. Obviously, he resided in heaven. He's the source of truth. He's the most accurate witness for truth. His testimony agrees with God. So why, why should I complain? And again, I know we keep going back and forth. We talk about the past, we talk about today. So today, this still happens. Let me give you some examples. First, if anyone calls himself vicar of Christ, Holy Father, or the representative of Jesus on earth, the representative, that's heretical. Jesus himself said that I will give you another helper, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, through the scriptures, will remind you of what I teach you or, or what I taught you. So who's the representative of Jesus on earth? The Holy Spirit, through the scripture. And who are the agents of the Holy Spirit? the church which Jesus says is the salt and light we should never try to dishonor Jesus or the Holy Spirit by competing with them in fact we should just keep pointing to them there's no competition only Jesus can truly purify only Jesus can supernaturally comfort only Jesus can change hearts only Jesus can reconcile sinners to the Father, and only Jesus should get all the glory. So there's no competition. There ought not to be. And if there is, if there is, it should only be because we try to expose falsehood. When you expose false teachers and heretics and cult cultic behavior and cultic teachings, you're not competing with them because they're not Christians. False teachers are wolves. And remember, again, what's the role of the best man? It's suppo he's supposed to make sure that the groom gets the bride in good condition. 
So if let's say you're gonna get married, okay, you, let's just pretend someone's gonna get married. A, a male friend of mine is getting married. So I know him and obviously I know his fiance, the bride, okay? Now, if there's another guy, a third party trying to seduce the girl, trying to, you know, hey, let's be text mates and chat mates and I wanna make friends with you. Oh, you're not married yet, you're just engaged. You know, why don't we have coffee and all, you know, as the best man, what's my job? First, <laughs> first, I, someone said kill, that's scary, no. My job is to first tell the groom, bro, there's a guy and he's kind of, he's like a shark circling your, your fiance. So what do you think we got, we will do about this? You know, <laughs> someone's saying finish him. That's really scary now, but really, the goal of the best man is to protect. He's supposed to say, hey, what are you doing? Why are you having coffee with that guy? You're supposed to be engaged. You know, you, your fiance is my good friend. And do you want to have issues when you're married? Like, quit this. And if you don't, we'll quit it for you. Right? That, that's, that's the job of the best man. All of us as a church, we are simply best men as well. Yes, the church is the bride of Christ. But as ministers of the gospel, we are also the best men, and we're supposed to protect the church. We're supposed to point to Jesus. We're supposed to tell everyone, just go to Jesus, go to Jesus. That's our role. Now, why do I belabor this point? Because today, again, back and forth, past and present, today, there is something happening in church called celebrity culture, or pastor worship, all right? Let me explain this further. The celebrity culture in Christendom today, or pastor worship, is the is you can't really um, you can't really put a ring around it because we don't know how far this extends. But basically, it's a culture that promotes personalities and pastors more than Christ. The whole pastor X, pastor X, that's just a manifestation or a or an effect or a symptom. I'll give you one example. Are you familiar with infographics? Okay, for those of you who don't know what those are, they are serious memes, all right? So memes are supposed to be funny, an infographic is supposed to be a serious version of a meme. And I've seen some infographics where the pastors are promoted. Let me give you some examples. And now, before I give you the example, some of you may know who these people are, rest assured. Um, I know these people personally, and I've tried communicating with them, and uh, efforts have been made, and uh, those same efforts have been rejected. Okay, so, no choice, have to do it publicly. But I will not mention names. But here's one. In the, in the infographic, it said, Christ's covenant changed our lives. And then under it, the name of the pastor. Not the name of the church, not scripture, nothing, just the name of the pastor. Here's another one. We are victorious in God. Underneath that, name of the pastor. Third, treat the name of God with respect. Underneath, name of the pastor, Pastor X. Five observations. One, the quotes are not insightful. I mean, seriously, Christ's covenant changed our lives. I'm sorry, I wanna say duh to that. Have you ever heard a sermon that said, Christ's covenant did nothing at all? You'll never hear such a preaching because this is basic. Secondly, we are victorious in God. Have you ever heard a preaching that says God loses? That Jesus lost the battle? Of course not. So again, this is common sense. Third, treat the name of God with respect. Pastor X. No, Pastor X didn't say that. Moses said that in the Ten Commandments. So why steal Moses' thunder? You simply paraphrase the verse and you get credit for paraphrasing the verse? Why am I nitpicking on this? Because, secondly, the church, churches like these give the impression that this is already deep. They're setting the standards for church members this low. And because that's the standard, everyone says, I just paraphrase a verse and I'm deep. So all you have to do is get the NLT translation, paraphrase it for yourself in street language, and wow, you're so insightful. That doesn't help. 
if a, if a child loves cereals, you have to train the child to eat meat and vegetables also. Don't say, you're eating cereals, great! That's already so nutritious for you! That's not beneficial spiritually for people. That hurts churches, that hurts church members. Three, the impression that this level of thinking is already deep is not just bad for members, it's also bad for the preacher. Because if a preacher preaches a very shallow sermon, and then the churches applaud the preacher, the preacher will become self-deceived. The preacher will think, wow, yeah, they're so impressed, therefore I really am deep. I am theologically accurate, and, and you know, the way I preach it, people are really growing. I should continue this cereal diet. That's the effect. It's very dangerous. Fourth, a steady growth of pride and ego will make both the preachers and the members point to themselves instead of Christ. I'm deep. He's deep. Remember I told you about emotionally codependent churches? So what happens? The church says, you're great as long as you keep uh, praising me. And as long as you keep praising me, I'm going to keep praising you. So they just praise one another consistently. That doesn't help. We're supposed to wound one another lovingly, challenge one another to be sanctified by grace. We're supposed to point to one another and say, guys, this area of our lives, we need to repent of this. We need to change this. We need to grow. We need to mature. We have to keep challenging one another. The Bible says in Proverbs, wounds from a friend can be trusted. An enemy multiplies kisses. We're supposed to help one another grow. And fifth observation, the overall result is a culture of celebrity and pastor worship that does not belong in biblical churches. It does not. It's dangerous for so many reasons. We seek to avoid that. And yes, I know there are also other famous preachers who are very theological, and there are also infographics out there with their names underneath. But let's take a look at some differences, okay? Now there's one, and it says this. Truth without love has no decency. It's just brutality, it's just brutality. On the other hand, love without truth has no character. It's just hypocrisy. John MacArthur. Here's another one. Antinomianism literally means anti-lawism. It denies or downplays the significance of God's law in the life of the believer. It is the opposite of the twin heresy of legalism. Antinomianism's primary error is confusing justification with sanctification. We are justified by faith alone apart from works. However, all believers grow in faith by keeping God's holy commands, not to gain God's favor, but out of loving gratitude for the grace already bestowed on them through the work of Christ. R.C. Sproul. Third, you will know this guy. God is most glorified in me when I am most satisfied in him. This is the motor that drives my ministry as a pastor. It affects everything I do. John Piper. Notice the difference of the content as compared to treat the name of God with respect. Paraphrased Moses. Three things that I observed from the second set of infographics. One, they were not made by their own churches. These infographics were made by people from other churches. Secondly, the quotes are far from shallow. And thirdly, these men have read and written countless books used by thousands upon thousands of pastors all over the world, have pastored churches for decades, and have pastored pastors. And they are also known for their grasp of the Greek and Hebrew and other biblical languages. They are known for reliable exegesis, and they are true scholars in that right. It's very, very different. So why did we talk about this? It's because we need to be careful also. Our hearts are very deceitful. 
It's so easy for us to love our church more than to love Jesus. It's so easy for us to have what we call church pride. And I honestly fear this for our church most. Of course, because we're pastoring the church. But I fear that. I'm so afraid one day we'll say, well, MCC is this and that. Well, at MCC, our elders are graduates of this and that. Or in MCC, our culture is... That scares me a lot. I hope we never get there. And I pray that if ever there's even a slight hint of that kind of mindset, we'll kill it right away, as soon as possible. There's no place for pride in a church that seeks to exalt Christ. We cannot be glory thieves. Look at verse 33. <coughs> Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Verse 35, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his Son. Uh, sorry, into his hand. So only Jesus can give the Spirit. Think about it. All the other prophets in the Old Testament, they could receive the Spirit. But only Jesus could give the Spirit. So John the Baptist is saying, it's only right that people go to him. We can translate that to today. Only Jesus can give the Spirit to cause growth, to cause change. He will either supernaturally change the person or supernaturally change the situation. But either way, only God can do it. We can't think for a moment that we have the same kind of power. And John the Baptist says that the Holy Spirit is the seal, the guarantee. In the Old Testament, you know what a seal looks like? If there's a letter and you send that letter, how do you know if that letter is really from the guy who allegedly wrote it? There's a wax and there's a seal, like a, it looks like a stamp, and they get that seal and uh, press it on the wax and then they press it on the, the parchment or envelope or manuscript or whatever. That authenticates and gives credibility and ownership to the letter. So if the Holy Spirit's seal is on you because you believe in Christ, Jesus not only owns you, but he also authenticates you and gives you the power to become a credible witness. There will be change in your life. People will not be able to deny it. They'll be able to say things like, oh my gosh, when you were, when you were in grade school or high school or college, I remember you. You were like this and that. Dude, what happened to you? What did you eat? You're different. What life experience did you have that you suddenly changed? And all you have to say is, I experienced God. God just changed my life, changed my heart. I couldn't stop it. So that's why we rest in Christ. We don't rest in His messengers. We thank God for His messengers, His preachers, His teachers, but we rest in Him, just as those other teachers rest in Him too. And look, the Father, remember, it's the Father who gives the seal, right? And so the Father promises this, through Jesus. Look at verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So if you believe in Jesus, God already forgives you, gives you his seal, authenticates you, owns you. There's nothing to fear. But if you reject Christ, if you don't believe in Christ, the wrath of God remains. There's no neutral ground. Again, there's no neutral ground. The wrath of God has already been there. The death has already been there, even before you were born. But once you believe in Jesus, the debt is removed. Because now Jesus owns you, and Jesus has paid that debt. So, to end, and I know it was quite a lengthy sermon, but to end, there are five observations from this whole text, and each observation has two choices. Here's the first. God owns you. 
either as an object of wrath and judgment or as an object of love and mercy and grace. Which one are you? And secondly, you will hear from two kinds of messengers. You will hear from faithful best men who elevate Jesus Christ, glorify Jesus Christ, point to Jesus Christ, or you will hear from heretics and false teachers who elevate themselves and elevate others, but never Christ. And that's dangerous. Three, therefore, you are expected to, you're expected to, first and foremost, not compete with faithful messengers. If someone is faithful in preaching and teaching the word, we're not going to go against that ministry. In fact, we'd be very happy to point you to faithful messengers and preachers and teachers. There are so many good books with amazing authors who have benefited us, helped us a lot. You know, we strongly, highly recommend reading. So we point to them and say, great, learn from them. And we're also ex expected to expose the falsehoods. You know, I read this satirical article online about a bookstore that suddenly had a heresy section. And I honestly wish it were true. It would make life so much easier. You know, you'll just go to a bookstore and say, oh, all the heresies are here and all the faithful teachings are here. Thank you. And if someone's browsing the aisle, you only have two questions. Is that person a heretic or is he studying apologetics? <laughs> right? You just approach the guy, hey, what are you looking for? This book. Why are you looking for that? Oh, because of this and that. Ah, apologist. Or, ah, oh my gosh, everything. Have to talk to him, share the gospel. You know, maybe you can bring them. Hey, you know, this is a great section, but you know what's an even greater section? Come with me. And you bring them to the better section of books. We help people grow. Fourth, you will also get two responses. Two responses. The first one, they will either repent and turn to Jesus and say, you know what, yeah, I was idolatrous and I worshipped our pastor and I, I was in the whole celebrity culture thing. I was divided the, the same way the Corinth church was divided. But now I realize that I was wrong and I repent and now my loyalty is to Christ. Or you're going to get unrepentance and you're going to get uh, retaliation. How could you be so critical? You judgmental judger. You know, you you're you're too technical. I don't I don't think you're loving. What are your intentions for saying these things? And then you can just say, Well, what are my intentions for saying these things? I don't want you to go to hell. Because you're you're right now committing idolatry. I say, Well you're you're judgmental. Well, don't you judge every single person who criticizes your pastor? If that's the case, you're being judgmental too. You just don't see it. You know, well, you're being technical. Well, you're being technical about my opinion. So don't, don't, you know, have a blind spot. But you have to see things clearly. And, you know, you say it with as much grace, with as much love. Of course, you don't say, well, your pastor is a false heretic teacher. and Don't do that. Explain to them calmly, you know. I hear what your pastor is saying. I hear what you're doing. I hear what you believe. Can we talk about this? I'd like to show you to some verses. I'd like to point you to some studies on this verse. Are you open to listening? If he says, well, you're judgmental, <laughs> how can I be judgmental when I'm just asking you to talk about something? That's not being judgmental, that's being open to talk. Being judgmental is when you label other people as judgmental without first hearing them, right? So we talk to them graciously, gently, lovingly, but also firmly. And lastly, and this is something I'd like every person here to pray about. This is the last part. Maybe you are called to do ministry. Okay, now, I'm not saying you're called to be a pastor and you're gonna freak out and go, no way! Okay, don't, don't jump to conclusions, okay? Maybe you're called to disciple someone. Maybe you're called to, maybe God's been doing something in your heart, just kind of poking your heart, saying, you know, you should start discipling this person. And you're probably thinking, huh, oh, I, 
I'm not ready. I need to study. I, I'm scared. It's freaking me out. What responsibility is this? Again, it's by grace. It's by grace. You don't have to be perfect to be in ministry because if that were the standard, there would be no church today. Okay? You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to reach, uh, you know, like next to Jesus' status. But if you're called to do ministry, maybe there's this desire in your heart to lead a Bible study, to disciple someone, to intentionally reach out to people on a regular basis, just sharing the gospel to them over and over and over again, and that could be ministry already. Pray about it. And if that's you, please talk to us. We're not just going to say, you're called to ministry. Go, God bless, and may God have mercy on your soul. We're not going to do that. If you feel called to do ministry, let us know. We'll guide you, train you, mentor you. We'll help you. We'll give you resources. We'll spend time with you. We'll have lots of coffee together. And we'll show you how to exegete verses, train you how to do this, teach you some skills on how to lead Bible studies, that what to do, what not to do. We'll spend time. So don't panic. Don't think I'm being called to ministry. That means I have to do it tomorrow. Maybe you're being called to do ministry. Great. Let's talk. We'll go through OJT. You know, we'll do co-mentoring and all that. And then maybe after a month, two months, maybe three months, then you can start. And we won't even just let you go do it alone. If you say, oh, I need some training wheels, we'll do that for you. But pray about it. Maybe God wants you to do something. For those of you who are missionaries, we appreciate everything you're doing right now. That is an amazing, amazing thing. And I'm sure you didn't go at it alone, and you're glad to have been mentored, have been trained, and all that, and you know, we're happy that you're here, and we hope that we're also a blessing to you guys so we can help one another, encourage one another. That's what we do in ministry. So I don't know where you are. I don't know if you're called to ministry. I don't know if you're convinced right now that you know I should talk to someone about a uh, celebrity culture or pastor worship that they should repent of or maybe I'm being called by God to just point to Jesus and stop pointing to myself and I have to repent of having Messiah complex I don't know where you are in your life right now but here's what I know God's love is so magnificent and so beautiful He can forgive any sin if we repent and yet His empowering grace is so awesome that he can also overcome any obstacle. All we have to do is rest in him first. Amen? Amen. So, let's end with prayer. Then after prayer, uh, we're going to, I'm going to pass it back to Freddy uh, for some announcements, and then we'll sing a few songs and then have lunch. Okay? All right. Let's pray.